You just need to turn it on, Dion. Yeah. There's a little switch on it. <laughs> One says off and the other says on. <laughs> Hello. There. Well, there you are. Uh, the Charleswood Historical Society welcomes everyone tonight to the fourth lecture uh, in our series of Heritage Lectures for the year 2015 and 16. Dan Furlan is our presenter tonight. Dan is the Vice President of Charleswood Historical and he uh, says he's a very amateur historian, but uh, from the tales that I have kind of been hearing a little bit about Prince Rupert, and many of us are really looking forward to this tonight, and from what Dan is saying, this man has led a very, very interesting life, and we are pondering, some of us, if we need a rating uh, for our lecture series, like general or X-rated or... Anyway, uh, welcome and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear. And, and uh, just to pick up on that theme, um, yes, I did mention that I should, as a disclaimer, uh, Prince Rupert's life was uh, full of violence, and uh, there were some romantic liaisons, and there is a tiny bit of nudity in this presentation, but tastefully done. <laughs> and I, I pick up on the fact that I am a, a very amateur historian, so if there are some professional historians in the room, please share with me more information about this, this amazing man. And how this came about was that um, we looked at the lecture series, which Jan uh, is, is uh, shepherding quite nicely, and saw a gap in there, and I thought, well, maybe we should do something on Prince Rupert. And the reason I say it because we had about the Hudson's Bay Company and one of the first councils was Prince Rupert and you hear about Prince Rupert this and that, not that much. And who is this German prince? Why is he tied in with the Hudson's Bay Company? How did this work out? And so I thought, well, let me find out more about this, this fellow. And, well, I mean, I got tired just reading about him. <laughs> really. Uh, remarkable man, as, as you'll see. And probably lived five different lives, if not more. And uh, talking with somebody earlier on, it could be a mini-series about this fellow. He's just really quite a, an amazing guy. So what we'll do is uh, let's take a walk through Rupert's land, and uh, that's where we are now, and that's what we'll pick up on, and uh, let's go ahead. Who is he really? Well, <clears throat> he was many things. He was a soldier. In actual fact, oftentimes he was a mercenary. So. I mean, at the early age of, of, of uh, 14 and 15, he was involved in the military, which is not uncommon for, for uh, um, you know, noblemen at the time. He was captured at one point, he was a prisoner, he was made a general in uh, the Royal Army, the, uh, his uncle Charles I of, uh, of England, he was made a general in that army. He was an admiral, but he was actually a pirate, but he was an official pirate on behalf of uh, Charles the First, Charles the Second at this point, because he was representing them and uh, playing on the parliamentary um, English merchant ships. He found time to be an explorer. He was a politician. Um, not that successfully because of his personality. He was a bit abrasive sometimes, and so he was often either on the ins or on the outs, and often time on the outs. He was a tremendous uh, inventor. <clears throat> A scientist, he was also an artist, an investor with the Hudson's Bay Company. The Hudson's Bay Company uh, relationship situation came up towards the last part of his life. He was doing all these other things beforehand. And then he was also a parent. But let me first of all also explain the times he grew up in, which were remarkable. <coughs> the religious wars of the 1600s were, were tremendous. And indeed, just in England alone, um, Henry VIII was Catholic and changed to Anglican, which is in essence not much different, but he was debating with the Pope. And many of the <coughs> monarchs of the, of the small states, of the larger states, would be con conflicted with the Pope because the Pope might be telling them what to do, they didn't want to do what he, what he said. And so whether um, 
they agreed with him or not, they often found ways of being at odds with him, and then the Protestant Reformation came along, and all of a sudden, ah, now there's a theoretical argument we have in the Pope, so you might ally yourself with the Protestant side or the Catholic side, depending on what you wanted to do politically. So many of the debates and fights, fights and wars they had, sometimes were over religion, sometimes were over politics, and sometimes over territory, but all wrapped up with the fact that um, these uh, principalities and kings and princes wanted to do what they wanted to do, and some were very pragmatic, and they would ally themselves with the Pope against someone else, and some others would ally themselves with the Protestant forces and attack the Catholic forces. It was a mess. It was a mess. It had a lot of impact on our group in his early life. So in essence, what happened was, in the, um, <clears throat> and mostly in Germany, a lot of small principalities, now, some of these exist today in Europe still. We have San Marino, which is between uh, France and Spain. Luxembourg is a little bit larger one. And you also have um, uh, Monaco, which is the most well known. So those are small states that, there's many small states like that, the varying sizes. And you had, some of them where the monarchy was electorate, and some where the monarchy was hereditary. And there's all sorts of family relationships as well. So. He had lots of family relationships with, with, uh, with Britain. And it was a tremendously violent time. And what took place was, <clears throat> the year he was born, or his, uh, probably his titles, Count Palatine of the Rhine, Duke of Bavaria, that was when he was just born. Later on, the King of England uh, appointed him as Duke of Cumberland, Earl of Holderness. He was a privy councillor. I was also a founding member of the Royal Society, plus a number of other scientific and artistic societies. His family background, great-grandmother was Mary Queen of Scots, his grandfather was James I of England, his mother was um, <coughs> Elizabeth Stewart, who was the sister of Charles I. And on the other side, he's related to the Bourbon family, the Orange family in, in, um, in Holland, and then a lot of German uh, relatives here, and of Denmark, so as you can see, many different connections, and this is a whole science in itself, the relationships, and who is related to who, and indeed, if you take a look at the, the chart for um, Elizabeth II, they trace her all the way back to almost Alfred, about 19, probably about nine, 150, not quite offered, but not quite, but almost that far back. So all these relationships are studied and followed. So he did have a lot of connections with Britain, and indeed uh, his sister Sophie, here's Rupert over there, right? His older brother Charles, Charles Lewis, inherited the principality they were um, endowed with. His sister Sophie, actually from her uh, came the Hanoverian line of uh, German Georges, when the British monarchy invited the Hanover family to George I, George II, George III, most of whom didn't speak English. George III spoke English. But that was the family line of the Hanovers that were brought over to England to continue the monarchy. So lots of family relationships. However, <clears throat> as I mentioned, Charles, Charles I of England was his Uncle, this is a time also that in addition to the religious wars in Britain, Parliament was battling and came over control over who was controlled the state, who made the laws, what was mandatory. With Henry the Henry the Eighth, he was in charge. Elizabeth the First, she was in charge. But then, when James the First was brought in from Scotland, he was James the Sixth of Scotland or James V, pardon me, he was brought in under certain conditions, and then his son, Charles I, uh, was in battle with Parliament for control. He had lost the battle. Oliver Cromwell and the, the Roundheads defeated him. So he had about 10 or 11 years of, um, of the, the protectorate. So Charles was actually shooting at Whitehall, but this is <clears throat> after they had lost one of the three civil wars in England. Rupert's cousin, Charles II, 
was defeated in 1651, spent nine years in, in exile, then brought back as the Merry Monarch, and he was a Merry Monarch. And by the time he was brought back, the country was just tired of all sorts of conflicts and said, let's, let's bring him back. Um, the protectorate hadn't worked out all that well. He was restored to the throne. And then his brother, <coughs> James I of England, inherited the throne after that, wasn't as popular, wasn't as politically astute, and then he lost the crown to William and Mary, who were invited in when he was chased out. So back to Rupert. Religious wars, tremendous turmoil, Parliament versus the King, as I mentioned, Charles I is beheaded, a number of civil wars, and eventually Charles II is asked back in. Small European states, shifting alliances, also colonization too. In addition to this, at the same time, uh, 1660, in the 1660s, you had the play back, the bubonic play at London again, as well as the Great Fire of London in 1666. So it's a tremendously uh, dramatic time. Rupert's father, <coughs> now, all these states, these small principalities were in what they called the, the Holy Roman Emperor, Empire. And of course, those people who read about these things know that it was neither Holy Roman nor an Empire. <laughs> But that's what they called it for quite some time. What happened was the new uh, head of the empire, the new emperor, was a Catholic. Rupert's father, Frederick, was elected leader of the, the Protestant Union. So within a very short period of time, he was urged to rebel against the emperor, and he had lost. So he was installed as a king of Bohemia, and within a year, he was out, lost the battle, and then <clears throat> referred to as the winter king because he was just in power for a very short period of time. The problem was that they left the council so rapidly, Rupert was almost left behind. Less than one year old, <laughs> and they dashed back in, they picked him up, tossed him in the carriage and took him along with them. So um, it was a tough start. Now, they found safe haven in the hay, uh, support, and there for the next, uh, well, roughly about uh, 10, 12, 13 years, um, he and his, his brothers and his sister were well treated. <clears throat> Their tutors were really fine with them, and they had a fine up in the very safe. Their parents largely ignored them, and that wasn't uncommon for wealthy and wealthy people at the time, but this is particularly um, bad. <laughs> I mean, in particular, they ignored them even more than most parents did at the time, so it didn't help. Uh, as it turned out, <clears throat> the discipline was strict, but he was a very able student, but sometimes unruly. He was very good at languages. The modern languages he was good at. Greek and Roman, not that much, but French, German, um, and, and English. He was quite good. Enjoyed uh, mathematics and science, and he found that um, over the years, mm. had an abiding interest in science. And this continued, and especially in the last part of his life, he spent a lot of time uh, in the lab. <clears throat> However, uh, he had a bit of a temper, so he was fiery, mischievous, and passionate. Um, really named Rupert the Devil. <laughs> so he had a bit of a point of view. But also, by the time he reached uh, 18, he was six foot four, which for the time would be a pretty large man, pretty large man now. So um, a pretty impressive build. Now, time, times changed. <clears throat> His father died when he was 13. So his uncle Charles in England said, uh, well, asked them to come over. Um, his mother said no, they didn't stay in the hay where they were. But Rupert was spent time in both the Dutch and the and the uh, the English court. Uh, he was, however, back on the uh, on the continent uh, as a military aide uh, at the age of fourteen, into the Battle of of Rydenburg. and after that, at the age of fifteen, he was in another conflict. So there's a, a war here in Spain. And he developed a real reputation for fearlessness. He was very brave, very innovative, and uh, quite willing to, to enjoy military life. Very resourceful. He was 16 at the time. From here, what happened was his older brother Charles Lewis attempted to recover the, uh, the homeland and eventually recovered half of it. Rupert was put in charge of a cavalry unit at the age of 17. So as you can see, at a very early age, he was really heavily involved. He had lots of, lots of control. Now this wasn't uncommon as well. As I say, you have these um, young princes 
and there's more the military and, and the involvement in early age. But at the Battle of, uh, I can't pronounce this, Velotho, a couple years later, he escaped as he was almost killed, but he was captured and tried to bribe his captors, as they often did, but that was, that was turned down. So he was imprisoned. Now, if you're um, a wealthy prince or a high uh, ranking noble, captivity is not that, is not that challenging. It's very comfortable because oftentimes someone will be ransomed or they weren't tossed in a dungeon like some, uh, some movies would say. The biggest pressure on him was that <clears throat> pressure on him to turn Catholic. And if he had done that, the emperor was prepared to provide him with a military um, a commission, with a small principality, with funds, but he refused, so he stayed there. But he became friends with the emperor's brother. During that time, he spent his time in hunting, shooting, playing tennis, reading books, and found time for a, a dalliance with his um, jailer's daughter. So um, he stayed for quite some time. But finally, negotiations, he agreed not to, not to take up arms against the emperor. Now this had happened fairly often. Uh, someone would be like, oh, you promise not to fight me. And uh, you fight these other people because, as I say, he became a mercenary. And so it came later on, he, he had to pick and choose his spot sometime, and this is one that was worth offering because the, uh, the emperor had a lot of territory, and he was uh, basically just starting out. Now the civil wars in England were taking place, so uh, he, went, he made his way um, across the English Channel, avoided the parliamentary navy, uh, more about the parliamentary navy in a couple moments, but he and uh, a group, his brother Morris came with him, a troop of soldiers. They eluded the Navy and, and uh, wound up joining Charles to help him out. I mentioned the Navy. The Navy often changed sides during the war. So right now this is a parliamentary Navy, so Rupert's in trouble if they catch him. Later on, they change sides. He becomes an admiral. <laughs> but then they change sides again. <laughs> So some of the fleet stayed with him, and some of the fleet went back to the parliamentary side. So it was a very confusing time. He was appointed general of horse. Now, <clears throat> uh, he was a, a well-known cavalry officer. He built up a force of about 3,000 people, and he won a number of uh, battles. He won the first major battle that he was involved in, and was a bit of a hero in the eyes of uh, many of the young, younger soldiers in the royal camp. Um, however, as has happened in war sometimes, He's very impetuous and very bold and daring, and some of the other commanders felt he was perhaps too reckless. So there was a lot of arguments and debate over military tactics, and he was very sarcastic with other people sometimes. Remember Rupert the Devil? Well, he's still with us. So that uh, caused him a lot of problem during this time and also in politics down the road. He was often odds, as I mentioned. As I mentioned, it's not uncommon in war. Um, Patton during the Second World War, um, opposition him and his competition with Monty. Also in the Battle of Balaclava, the charge of the Light Brigade, a real mess based on some of the context of some of the uh, behavior of some of the generals. So uh, this is not uncommon. He was very aggressive. Now some of the tactics they used on the continent were a bit tougher than the tactics they used in Britain. Um, he was accused of um, slaughtering an entire city, uh, which he didn't do, but he was prepared to. <laughs> and uh, uh, they restrained him from doing it because it was, it was take, no, take no prisoners, basically. He wound up doing that later on. So he was a, a, a pretty edgy type, and some of the other commanders felt that he was um, too aggressive. As a matter of fact, Parliament wanted him to be punished. There's any part of a peace settlement that said, whatever peace we make, he has to be punished, and later on they banished him from England. So he was, um, um, I suppose, one of those tough guys you wanted to have on your side in a street fight. He was very generous and frank. He, he did lots of social cases, and there were some other commanders who were a little bit more politic at court, and, and not as successful in war, but a bit more uh, tactful and able to hit the teams here. So uh, he was popular with the team, but his position was undermined by 
by other people. Now, uh, even here, this dog, when he was a prisoner, he was given a poodle, and he named him Boy. I'm not going to make a choice about the name. But the point is, uh, he was given a, a very rare white poodle. And these poodles, by the way, were actually a German dog. They're popularized in France, but they're actually a German dog. And the hunting dog is actually the, the source. Now, the dog was accused of witchcraft. And they said he was a devil. Well, this is the 1600s, and, and they're still burning people in, in Salem and other places like that. So they said he was a devil, he was invulnerable, he could find hidden treasure and catch bullets in his mouth. Um, Rupert also had a monkey, which was reputed to be a shapeshifter to see behind enemy lines. We don't know the name of the monkey. And this is a, a parliamentary uh, uh, cartoon, political cartoon. He was a common figure of propaganda, and boy is, is shown uh, down below there, uh, be, below the hooves of his horse, pillaging the town of Birmingham. And the monkey is not to be seen. Of course not. Yeah, you uh, can feel his presence, but he's not there. <laughs> now, um, this presentation we want to all sorts of back and forth during the battles of win lose some and win some, win some lose some in the Civil War because there was a tremendous uh, conflict and there wasn't the thing would be at one place uh, and everyone all his forces would be there would be different armies around and Rupert might have an army in one place and some else uh, some other place that they might be in that location so there's lots of different battles took place all over the country. Um, they impressed, he impressed at most of the battles. He lost the Battle of Marston Moor, which is a major battle. Also, by the time uh, he was appointed general of the entire army, advised against the Battle of Naseby, which is a major battle as well. They lost that battle. He advised against have a battle that day. The king overruled him. They had the battle and lost. He was urging the king to make peace. By the end of that uh, summer, facing impossible odds, he surrendered the castle of Bristol. Uh, the king was not present, was upset about that, dismissed him from command and from his service. Now, Rupert um, fought his way to where the king was. The king didn't want him there. The king was worried that there'd be a coup. Rupert was going to take over. And that wasn't the case. He wanted to defend his name. Now there's a debate as to why he wanted to defend his name. Was it just pride? Or was it his, a fair move? Because he did have, have a bit of a career as a mercenary. And if he was in the reputation of having given up Bristol, surrendered Bristol, that might not be an endorsement for his, uh, his military prowess. Who knows? Uh, it's just a, a passing comment that was made. He was exonerated. He demanded a court martial. Port Marshall was held, he was exonerated. Then he and his brother Morris resigned, and he took most of his best cavalry officers with him. At this point, as I mentioned, he thought the Royalist cause was lost, and so this is not um, too much of a surprise. So he and his brother spent the winter at, um, at Woodstock, and looking at possible options, as I mentioned, all of these principalities and all his territorial ambitions there was an option for them to be working for the Venetian Republic, but they returned to his service in Oxford as the war was continuing. I should make an aside for a moment that what would happen during some of these wars where you have a small principality attacking someone else, when the war was over, the real problem is they had an army of five, six, seven thousand armed ruffians with no jobs. So they might be going around to different territories and they hold them the fleet companies. As a matter of fact, sometimes a prince would pay them to go off to another war because they didn't want them in the territory. Rupert wasn't in that group, but there was just a bit of a background to that. He joined the King's service again in Oxford, but after a siege of a standard, Parliament was, was triumphant and he was banished from England he and his brother Morris. So the Royal Court moved to, to the continent. Uh, his, his income was less secure. 
the four of his others at uh, Fort, which was uh, not uncommon for Rupert. So he was available for work. Louis XIV, when he was quite young, engaged him to fight for France against Spain. The Thirty Years' War had been going on for quite some time, so he enjoyed, he joined, um, he joined Louis XIV's service on condition that he be free to fight for Charles if called on. And this is sometimes they join an army on condition that um, I might be recalled, or also, as long as I don't have to fight against the emperor, because he had agreed to not oppose the emperor. But this is in Spain, so no problem. Uh, <coughs> he quietly negotiated, he was, one of the few things he did quietly, negotiated the surrender of a powerful fortress, and um, was really recognized as quite a, an adept negotiator for doing that. So he was very successful at that. However, he was ambushed. He and the other general he was working with were ambushed by a Spanish patrol and he was shot in the head, which is a very serious injury. He suffered for years. Uh, his entire life with this injury uh, caused him many problems. At the time, uh, the other general, Gaston said, Sir, I am most annoyed that you're injured, you're wounded. And me also, <laughs> who is supposed to have replied. Um, this and later on, a, uh, a sea injury, he was injured at sea, had a problem with his leg, and that troubled him as well during his entire life. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the injury to his head, I don't know what it was, but um, he had to undergo fairly often trepanning, which is a, um, an old time, not that much of an old time uh, process of they drill a hole in the skull to relieve pressure. And they still do that to some extent in some areas, but uh, at the time, um, it was a very, um, um, a very painful process. And in fact, later on in his life, he came up with some, some new equipment to do a better job. Join the Navy. Well, after the Second World War, Second uh, English War, he informed Lewis he joined the, joining Charles's service. Now, as I mentioned, the Navy, well, Parliament's Navy had mutinied and sailed to Holland to support the king because the king was still established in Corpus, was in, in Holland. Um, they had changed sides, they joined him. Rupert joined the Indisciplined Navy, which was really, they were underfunded, undisciplined, and Rupert brought some discipline to it. However, uh, in one case, there was a, a number of mutinies. He defused one by taking the leader and holding him over the side of the boat the vessel and threatening to drop him into the ocean. That settled that one down. But eventually the, um, the Navy did mutiny and only, only part of the Navy stayed with him. So they, some of the fleet switched sides in. He was in charge of the real, remaining fleet and they were very short of funds. So what they embarked on was official piracy. And what would happen is that the him would say, I'll give you authorization, letters of mark to represent me and be a privateer for, for our cause. They were very successful, and what they were doing was between Ireland and Portugal, <coughs> raiding the, the British trade fleet back and forth, which is quite extensive fleet. However, the uh, parliamentary side also had a tremendous admiral. Um, <coughs> Charles went down to, or maybe, um, Rupert went down to Portugal, was King Ferdinand supported Charles. However, the um, successful parliamentary admiral, Admiral Blake, who was a very, very effective admiral, followed him there. The Portuguese king was um, a little uncomfortable with both of these fleets in his, in his harbor, asked them all to leave. They did. Rupert, <coughs> well, captured some more ships, but lost one and tremendous amount of treasure in a terrible storm. And, and the problem was that they're trying to capture these, these ships so they can get more treasure, more funds to continue supporting Charles. He um, repaired it at Cape Blanc and went into uh, Africa, went up to the Gambia River, went up about 150 miles up the river, captured a couple more Spanish vessels up there, but also contracted malaria, which also troubled him as well as his injuries for his whole entire life. <coughs> Coming out of the Caribbean, the, uh, the Mediterranean, uh, me, coming out of the, uh, <coughs> the adventure in Gambia, they went off to the Caribbean, and the fleet faced another uh, terrible, terrible storm there. They went to the uh, 
among other places, Virgin Islands. I've been there myself, and it is a scene of a lot of terrible hurricanes. And so they lost uh, their major uh, ship there, the Defiance, as well as his brother uh, Morris, who was very close to. They spent a lot of time together, and that was a terrible blow to him. They had five ships left, so he returned, and they split the difference of the uh, expenses and the remaining um, <coughs> income from this, this piracy adventure. And um, basically, he was very tired and bitter, and didn't see be any prospect of uh, Charles being successful. He retired to recuperate in France. <coughs> now, there was an assassination plot against Oliver Cromwell at this time. Rupert was implicated. I don't have the details on that. Charles was opposed to this, so he did not support it. And uh, Rupert's presence at the court was not popular. And he was a very uh, <coughs> considered to be a very bellicose uh, figure, and so a bit of a barrier, so he departed for Germany. Now, his brother Charles Lewis, Charles was the older brother, so if there was an inheritance, if there was uh, a duchy to inherit, Charles would have first um, call on that, but he did have some obligations to the rest of his family to have them settled and to, to support them. So he had retained half of Bohemia, but was still badly sort of money. Uh, this is a picture of Charles on the left <coughs> and Rupert on the right. They'd never been close, never been all that friendly when they were children. Uh, but uh, Charles did have some obligations to support Rupert, but he was not able to give him more than uh, about 375 pounds. And he owed him more money, but he just didn't have the funds to pay it. <coughs> Rupert then went down to Vienna to um, had, he did have a claim uh, against the emperor for approximately 15,000 pounds, but the emperor didn't have the funds to pay. So he had to settle for an installment plan. <laughs> but I suppose that's better than nothing. But you really see the, the implications of all these different threads of, I mean, the emperor, who he had been fighting against, owed him money and was prepared to pay it. So um, there's there's all sorts of sensibilities here. At this point, the Duke of Medina asked him to raise armies to invade his neighbors. One of them was the Papal States. And in Italy, uh, the favorite pastime was invading the neighbors. And you would hire someone, and they come and help you as a mercenary, and then sometimes they switch sides because they decide to offer them more money. So this was something that was planned, but the, the, the plan fell through. While he was at his brother's, though, he fell in love with his sister-in-law's maid of honor and sent her a love note, but didn't say who it was to. His sister-in-law received it. She thought the world of Rupert, and she thought it was for her. She was very unhappy to find out what Rupert had to explain this. I mean, this is like a TV show. <laughs> <laughs> Rupert 